I spent the last few hours updating our rest of season rankings after the games on Sunday, and here are going to be the players that are moving up those rankings. Now, we're going to order these guys from the least risers to the most risers, if that makes sense. Starting off with Josh Downs, obviously Josh Downs had a phenomenal game, right? I mean, Josh Downs comes out and he actually sees nine targets last week. 12 targets this week for nine receptions, 69 receiving yards. He is the vast majority of the volume here in Indianapolis. And this is the biggest game that we have had from the Colts all season. Now you may ask, well, Mason, why is he at the bottom end of this list? Why is he not a massive, massive riser? It's because Anthony Richardson could be back next week. And here with Joe Flacco, yes, you had 44 pass attempts. Yes, with Joe Flacco, you had 359 passing yards. That's not going to be the case with a rich. I'm going over looking at Josh Downs in my rest of season rankings. We have him alongside Rashid Shaheed, Keon Coleman, Dontavian Wicks. Obviously we'll talk about Dontavian Wicks and Keon Coleman in the losers video. Now going over to what we have with our next riser, we are going to be looking at Wandale Robinson with Wandale. This is another player phenomenal game here. Two weeks ago, you get the 18 fantasy points off of 14 targets. This week, while the volume comes down a bit and you only see nine targets, you actually get 16 fantasy points in a game where Daniel Jones does look respectable. And Daniel Jones is the main reason I'm actually moving Wandell Robinson up these rankings. Because previously, I viewed Wandell Robinson as someone that in a regular fantasy football league where you only start two receivers and one flex, you really couldn't consider him because it's going to be a low volume passing attack with an alpha wide receiver, Malik Neighbors. But I'm having a little more faith in Daniel Jones with how he's been playing as of late. Going through and looking at my updated ranking, I now have Wondell Robinson right around the same range as Keenan Allen, Calvin Ridley, Khalil Shakir as a receiver that I'm still definitely not excited to play in any game that you have Malik Neighbors back in. And that's why Wondell's not rising up that, that much, right? Similar to Josh Downs, Wondell Robinson was in a great situation this week, but the situation will get worse going into the next one. Now going over to our next player. We are going to be looking at Zay Flowers. Now, the reason why we have to move Zay Flowers up just a bit is you see the ceiling that this Ravens offense has. Now, the reason we are not moving him up a ton is because we know the Ravens still want to run the ball when they get the opportunity to. So really not much does change with the role of Zay Flowers, where you get the 12 targets this week, which is beautiful to see, but it's in the context of 54 Lamar Jackson dropbacks. So 54 Lamar dropbacks is only going to happen in a game such as this game against the Cincinnati Bengals, where it turns out to be the highest scoring game of the week. It just is a full-blown shootout, and the Baltimore Ravens are having to keep up with a top offense. If the Ravens are going to be winning the majority of games going forward, we still expect it to be a rush-first offense. So with Flowers, despite the great week, despite the 19 fantasy points, we do still have him pretty much as that mid-wide receiver three at wide receiver 32, which honestly, I think we had him at wide receiver 33 before the game. Now moving over to Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels every single week proves to be a riser. Jaden Daniels now has four games this season with more than 20 fantasy points. We'll talk about why Josh Allen's falling in the fallers video, of course, but you're not getting that kind of consistency with Josh Allen. So I've actually moved Lamar Jackson up to QB1. I still have Jalen Hurts at QB2, and I moved Jaden Daniels up to QB3 ahead of Josh Allen, specifically in a four-point passing touchdown format where we are chasing rushing upside, rushing upside, rushing upside. And if you look at the rushing stat line that you've had from Daniels so far this year, 88 yards week one, 44, 39, 47, 82, four rushing touchdowns through the first five games. I mean, clearly has been one of the best quarterbacks in fantasy. Now, staying inside the same offense, Terry McLaurin's been very good as well. Now, with Terry McLaurin, I have him ranked wide receiver 30 rest of season, right in the same range as Jalen Waddell, Deontay Johnson, Savior Worthy. To be honest with you, I would have McLaurin higher in our rankings this next week than some of these other players. I just expect with Waddle, you're going to get Tua back. With Worthy, you're going to have the rookie continuing to improve. And while McLaurin has been phenomenal, like I don't want to take anything away from him. Uh, you can see here that McLaurin this year is sitting here with 61% of the intended air yards in Washington. The issue is while Daniels has been great from a efficiency and rushing perspective and real life perspective as well, it's still not a super high volume passing attack. The highest game that you've had in terms of passing yards for Jane Daniels this year is 254. 
So while Daniels is a phenomenal real-life quarterback, and McLaurin has a massive role in this offense that should be a very good offense going into the future, it's not going to be a high-volume passing attack in particular. Now, you will see that I had the most brutal loss you could literally ever imagine in the Flock League. I, I have never seen anything like this in my, enti- in my entire life. It will come out tomorrow on the Flock League channel. I would have just won if I started Ramadre Stevenson. Ramadre was on my bench this week for the reason being that we were told that he was benched for Antonio Gibson. So I had moved Ramondre Stevenson down to being that mid to low end RB3 in our rest of season rankings. Going, if you're in a committee running back in one of the worst offenses in the NFL, I'm not super, super excited about it. But Ramondre comes out this week. He gives you the rushing touchdown. You have four targets as well. So I mean, this is a running back that's been getting you three to four targets a game. The opportunities are still there where he's averaging about 14, 15 carries a game. Now going into the future, um, looking at the snap usage, Ramondre Stevenson with this graph from PFF, you'll see has just continued to go down. He played 28 snaps in comparison to Antonio Gibson at 28 snaps. So I'm not moving Ramondre up that much. I have Ramondre right behind Zach Moss, Rico Dowdle, Rashad White in our rest of season ranks. Um, well, obviously, we'll talk about Rico Dattle later in this video, but yeah, I still stand by. I mean, it looks like Stevenson is a committee running back and one of the worst offenses in the league. Now, going over to a running back that's stuck in a committee and one of the worst offenses in the league, um, we have Raheem Mostert. Now, this committee thins out just a bit, knowing that you have the Devon Achan injury. Now, Achan does get the extra week to recover here because he has the week six bye. So that is the saving grace, but I honestly had Mostert like bottom of the barrel, barely worth the Rasha spot in our rankings previously. So by default, when he comes out, when he has a pretty damn good week where you get the 19 carries, you have the 80 rushing yards as well. I had to remove Raheem Mostert up. I have him up at RB45. It's right alongside Alexander Madison, Tank Bigsby, and Austin Eckler. And honestly, I'm just holding off to get more injury news regarding Devon Achan. And if Achan's going to miss time here, I think you can move Mostert even even higher than this. It would be definitely a spot I'd move him higher if they didn't have the bye week in week six. Now we did start Javante in the flock league. Main reason being is it was a very good matchup for Javante Williams, right? And this is why I'm not going to be overreacting in these rankings where we do have Javante at RB 32 in our rest of season ranks. Obviously it was very exciting to see him lead this backfield, but we've seen it time and time again. Yeah, this is, I want to say the what, fifth straight week where Javante has led this backfield in touches. He has the majority of work as a receiver. He has the majority of the work as a rusher. The main issue that you have here in Denver is the Denver Broncos aren't going to be winning a lot of games. So you're not going to have the ability to run the ball in the second half a ton. And honestly, that's one of my favorite reasons why I like the Chris Olave higher than 59 and a half receiving yards tonight because I don't think the Saints are going to be able to run the ball a ton in the second half against the Chiefs and if you want to tell me on that you can find the link to underdog fantasy in the description and comment section if you use promo code flock you will get a 50% deposit bonus up to a thousand dollars you'll get a free Patrick Mahomes pick more than less than half a total yard and you will get a free team review over there on flockfantasy.com that we are doing on the live stream every single night but yeah with Javante game environments not going to be great Bo Nix still super inefficient so I still have Javante just as a running back three flex consideration. He's right behind Rico Dowdle, Rashad White, and Ramondre Stevenson in my rest of season ranks. Now going over to Brock Bowers. I mean, Bowers, obviously phenomenal game. I believe we had him at tight end four coming into the week. And honestly, at this point, you have to move him up to tight end three. Looking at the usage that you have in though Devontae Adams, off the charts, you have 12 targets in the direction of Brock Bowers. While, yes, the quarterback play is going to be absolutely garbage in this offense, that maybe limits the overall touchdown upside that you have with Brock Bowers here. Just getting enough volume at the tight end position this year with how ugly the position is overall, that's going to be enough. So I think you can go ahead, pencil in Bowers right alongside Kelsey and right alongside McBride. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get another performance like this. And if Devontae Adams has dealt, I will move Brock Bowers ahead of Trey McBride in our rest of season ranks. Now, moving over to our next guy, we are going to be looking at Chase Brown. Now, Chase Brown, honestly, may may be a bigger mover than this when it's all said and done. But I wanted to just throw him with the Cincinnati Bengals players because we're going to be talking about all the Bengals here, right? It's a five touchdown day for Joe Burrow. So we kind of got to give everybody a little bit of love. Um, But with Chase Brown in particular, it all hinges on the injury that you have to Zach Moss. Ported to be an ankle injury if Zach Moss misses any time. Chase Brown will be a must-start running back 
in one of the best offenses in the league over the past two weeks, averaging about 20 fantasy points per game, having the usage as the receiver. Honestly, Brown, this rest of season rank is going to change a ton. Obviously, you can check out all the rest of season rankings on flogfantasy.com whenever you're wanting. But right now, we have him at RB27. If it looks like Zach Moss is going to miss time, though, like I said, he could move even higher than this. Now, hitting with the Bengals guys real quick, there's not much room to move these players up. We still have Joe Burrow, QB7, mid QB1. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he leads the NFL in passing yards, passing touchdowns, but he's not going to run the ball as much as Kyler Murray. He's not going to run the ball as much as Josh Allen. He's not going to run like Lamar. He's not going to run like Daniels. He's not going to run like Hurts. So that does keep him down here as that mid QB1. Um, we already had Jamar Chase as the elite receiver. We did all year. Uh, because of the Nico Collins injury, we actually did move Chase ahead of Collins, though, to wide receiver four. Um, T. Higgins, actually, I've drafted a decent amount of Higgins on underdog, so it feels good. Uh, but we still have him here as pretty much that guy you're either starting at wide receiver two or the flex spot every single week, right alongside Devontae Adams, D.J. Moore, and Pugandakua in the rest of season ranks. Now, moving over to our next player we're going to look at, played super early Sunday morning. Garrett Wilson may officially be leading the NFL in targets. You see the massive day here where Aaron Rodgers struggles that it doesn't even matter. You get the 30 bomb for Garrett Wilson. You get the 29 fantasy points off of 22 targets. They're going to force feed him. They're going to send everything in his direction. I currently have him at wide receiver 10 in our rest of season rankings, directly behind Nico Collins and Tyree Kill. The primary issue that you're going to have here is this is still a very inefficient offense. Well, while yes, you are getting force fed the volume from Rodgers, at the same time, it's not like we can say that this offense is going to be top three in the NFL in touchdown opportunities. Now, going over to Brandon Ayuk, I'm not having to move Brandon Ayuk up my rankings at all, to be honest with you, but I think some of y'all will have to. Where Brandon Ayuk comes out and you have the 22-point performance, first time this year that he's hit double-digit fantasy points. Obviously, if you drafted the guy in round two, He's not going to return value based off how bad he was through the first four weeks. You're already kind of behind the eight ball. However, if you were completely sold out on brains and Ayuk, thinking that this was somebody that you could no longer start, I have no idea how many times we begged and pleaded for people to start him in the live stream over the past week. You now hopefully have the reminder that you have to start Ayuk every single week, just like you have to start Debo every week, just like you have to start Kittle every week, because there should be a ton of points scored here in San Francisco. The offense is spread out among these top four to five options, but it's not like you have nine offensive skill positional players touching the ball like you would have in some other offenses. So while you do have a serious amount of target competition in a funny way, it is very concentrated just with a handful of players, which is always what we see with Shanahan. So Ayuk still remains that must start guy every week. We have him right alongside Mike Evans, Jaden Reed, DK Metcalf in the rest of season ranks. And then going over to Stefan Diggs, I have to give a massive apology. We clearly had uh, Diggs as a sell eye candidate last week, which looks very bad at this point. With Diggs coming out, seeing eight targets, dominating take tell with targets yet again, you have the Nico Collins injury, which is what opens up Stefan Diggs to now have the insane ceiling. Because previous to this, we were operating under the assumption that Nico Collins was that elite alpha wide receiver that was just going to absolutely dominate the target share in Houston. What's actually funny is right before Collins goes down, yeah, you get the two receptions, 78 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown. And Nico Collins literally played nine snaps. In nine snaps, Nico Collins had 76 receiving yards. But anyway, if Collins misses any time here, Stephon Diggs would probably be a top 12 wide receiver in my rankings for that week. Obviously, when Collins is back in, then at that point, Stephon Diggs does fall back down to being closer to that brains and Ayuk range. So as it stands... At the time of this recording, when we don't have a ton of information about the Nico Collins injury, I'm going to put Stefan Diggs at 17. We'll have him right behind Debo Samuel, Chris Olave, and Devonta Smith. Now, we need to go over to the Chicago Bears. Another player that I had as a sell-high candidate last week that looks horrible now is DJ Moore. DJ Moore, the fifth week in a row, giving you double-digit fantasy points, finally coming out and showing the elite-level ceiling. And what did it take? It took the game from Caleb Williams that we've been waiting for. Caleb Williams hits 300 passing yards and two passing touchdowns. And this is a very different performance in comparison to what you had back when he played against the Indianapolis Colts, 
where you go back to the game in Indy, there Caleb Williams had 363 passing yards. But that was off of 52 pass attempts. That was with two interceptions. This was a great Caleb Williams game. 29 pass attempts gets you the 300 passing yards. Looked great, was hyper-efficient. Clearly, it was a really strong matchup going up against the Carolina Panthers. But this will be the tide that rises all boats. I mean, I have a little more hope for Roma Dunze going forward. I have Rome ranked right alongside Terry McLaurin, Amari Cooper, Zay Flowers. Um, I started DeAndre Swift. I love the Swift production that we had. Now, obviously, the issue is Roshan Johnson steals a couple of the rushing touchdowns at the goal line. And Swift, this is back-to-back massive weeks here where you had the 30-point performance two weeks ago. We get the 20-point performance this past week. So, I, I don't know. Swift is training towards being a running back that you're very excited to play in games where the Bears can actually win. Now, of course, if the Bears fall behind, the game environment gets away from them, then there would be a little bit tougher. I have DeAndre Swift ranked alongside J.K. Dobbins, Travis Etienne, and Nick Chubb in our rest of season ranks. Now, going over to Tyrone Tracy. Very interesting situation that you have here in New York. One, we don't have a ton of information regarding the injury that you're currently dealing with with Devin Singletary. If Singletary ends up missing, say, two, three, four weeks, I will move Tracy even higher in these rankings. Um, Tracy was great this week. You get the 18 carries for 129 rushing yards. Now, to be honest, if we're looking at the snap data from PFF, I'm a little bit concerned where you had 13 snaps for Eric Gray on third down, and you had zero snaps for Tyron Tracy. Tracy was the early down back. Gray was the third down back, and presumably you would have him in the two-minute drill as well. So if the Giants are going to win the game, Tracy looks great. If the game gets away from the Giants, then I'm probably a little more concerned. And I think the Giants will be losing more games than not going into the future. Um, Tucker Craft will be our next player. Um, Tucker Craft looks phenomenal. Immediate top 10 tight end the second that Jordan Love came back. I mean, he had nine targets two weeks ago, so the volume was there. That's what got us super excited about Tucker Craft. But this past week, you actually see the efficiency. You see the big play upside off of only five targets. You get the 88 receiving yards. Looks phenomenal with the long touchdown. I mean, actually looking at this from next-gen stats, Tucker Craft reached a top speed of 19.7 miles per hour on a 66-yard touchdown reception, the fastest speed by a tight end this season. Obviously, we want to be monitoring what we have with Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs' availability because, honestly, the receivers do coming back in should maybe steal a target or two away. Um, we have Kraft at tight end eight rest of season right behind Kincaid, Laporta, and Ferguson, but clearly has room to continue to move up these rankings. Going over to our next guy, we are going to be looking at Tank Bigsby. Um, Bigsby, uh, thank God he's on our underdog teams, but I will say we have to take a massive L. I, I didn't think that he was a super interesting waiver wire pickup this past week. And the reason for this is, if you're looking at the underlying snap data, he was really splitting that secondary role with Dearness Johnson, where two weeks ago, you only had 29% of the snaps. Now this week, to be honest, well, Bigsby just looks phenomenal. I am maybe a little bit concerned here that it's unsustainable, but I mean, hell, if you're looking at the yards per carry so far this year, week one, 6.08, week three, 4.5, week four, 12.86, this past week, 7.7. I mean, the man has looked really, really good. Now, going over looking at the snap data, you had 23 snaps for Bigsby, 22 snaps for ETN, 13 snaps for Dearness Johnson. Coaching staff still saying ETN's the guy. Obviously, ETN has to be a massive follower. We'll talk about ETN in the followings video. Bigsby has to be a massive riser. I have Bigsby up at RB43. Right behind Spears, Pacheco, Madison. If you're in a non-PBR format, you'd be a lot more excited about Bigsby. One of the issues that you have is this is a running back that just simply is not used as a receiver. He's had one target all season. Now, going over to our next guy, we're going to be looking at Rico Dowdle. Rico Dowdle, you actually get the blow-up game from, where you have the 20 rush attempts for Dowdle against a good Pittsburgh Steelers defense. You get the receiving touchdown as well. Dowdle looks great there. So 22 opportunities in an offense that you'd expect to be an above-average offense going into the future. 
So I definitely think you can be excited about Dowdle. And then going over to the number one riser that we have, honestly, Dowdle's probably the number one riser. But we'll throw Brian Thomas in here anyway. They're both super exciting. Um, Thomas, we have him up there in the same range as Puka Nakua, T. Higgins in our rest of season ranks. Looks like a must-start guy for you every single week. Doesn't matter if you're putting him at wide receiver two. Doesn't matter if you're putting him at the flex. Hyper-efficient and obviously for dynasty fantasy football leagues. Be even more excited where the long-term outlook looks phenomenal. And ETN was much better this week as sports books were projecting the Jags to be. But I think that's all I have for you. Again, I really appreciate you. And of course, if you want to tell me on that Chris Olave higher than 59 and at receiving yards, you can find that link to Underdog Fantasy in the description in the comment section. Using promo code FLOCK, you will get a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000. Plus with promo code FLOCK, you'll get that Patrick Mahomes free pick, more than less than half a total yard. And you are going to be getting an additional free team review over there on flockfantasy.com. All you got to do is make sure that you set up an account on flockfantasy.com with the same email address as your account on Underdog Fantasy. That way I know who to hook up with that free team review. But thank you again. I really appreciate you. Really hope we were able to help you out and really hope we get to see you out in the live stream sometime soon.